I was reminded when you started, when they tried to push you in, uh, just to date myself. How many of you have ever defragged a disc? Okay, old people in the room. <laughs> so you had to defrag a little bit here. For you don't know what defragging is, count yourself lucky. <laughs> Anybody enjoy defragging? Like looking at little, yeah. It was good, like looking at moving little bits and pieces around, you felt really good after, about it, after it. I like the results, yeah. It always felt faster. The computer always felt faster afterwards. That was awesome. All right, 640K should be enough for everyone. All that. Anyway, hello, friends. There's a lot of you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> they put stuff in the way, so I can't see everyone, but that was weird. Welcome back after lunch. One of the advantages about NDC Oslo is that there's food available all the time. So hopefully you don't have that massive food coma that sometimes people have after lunch. Uh, we're going to talk about building a glorious monolith, and then we're going to talk about carving it afterwards. Uh, just because I'm curious, how many of you work with, or currently working with a distributed application or microservices, whatever definition you have of it? Quite a few of you. Enjoy it? Who enjoys it? Who hates it? <laughs> oh, okay, a couple of those. Who's working with a monolith? Yeah, a few of those as well. Who loves it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Out of those, uh, who's working with a distributed monolith? Okay, there's a couple of those. Well, if you don't know what a monolith is and all that stuff, we're going to get into that. We're going to def define a little bit. So I'm Glenn. I'm, uh, I currently work at a startup called Justify. We make, make sure you get your personal legal affairs in order. Um, to do this, we built an application, of course. That's why I'm here, that's what I love to do, swapping code for food. Uh, and we early on decided that we wanted to go not for the microservice distributed application path right away, although it was tempting. Uh, instead, we went to build a monolith by purpose, but we wanted to make it glorious, not the other kind. So in technical terms first, the, what's a distributed application and what is actually a monolith? So monolith, by definition, the dictionary says a large single upright block of stone, especially one shaped into serving as a pillar of a monument. You don't really feel that the monolith you're building is a monument to something, do you? Except your own stupidity, maybe. The other definition is a large, impersonal, political, corporate, or social structure regarded as indivisible and slow to change. And it's a few more nodding when I say that. Yeah, okay, that sounds about right. So when you're building a monolith, you're building one application. It's compiled and deployed as a single unit. Everything is in one, maybe not project, but solution. It's all built into one thing. It's deployed as a single unit. It runs as a single unit. It is a thing. And they call it monoliths because they often get very big and unwieldy. The other cool kit on the block is the microservice. It's an architectural style. It's not so much a word as the monolith is. You structure your application in small pieces, thus the name micro. The services should be loosely coupled. They should be highly maintainable. Testable is a good thing to have on those things. You should be able to deploy every single microservice independently. And they're often, or should be, organized around business concerns. And the general consensus, if you go online, is that monoliths are bad and microservices are good. At least that's what people say on the internet. And of course, if they're right on the internet, it has to be true. But, <laughs> and it seems like these are your only two options, a really shitty monolith or a really awesome microservice thing. And we, as a business, sometimes suffer what I call technological jerking off. Because we, we pick a technology for the technology's sake, not because it's good for the business, because we like it, it's cool. It's also called resume-driven development, <laughs> where I want to build some microservice, I'm going to put that on my resume when I apply for my next job, which is going to be cooler than this one. So it seems like you have these, these chances. And starting out with microservices seems like a good idea for many, 
But in reality, it's playing this game on hard mode. Because if you never built microservices before, you don't really know what you don't know. And there's a lot of things you should know when building microservices. It's really cool if you make it and you get dragon rights, which is awesome. Uh, but it's going to take unnecessarily longer, and it's going to take a significantly more skill, because there are some fallacies to distributed computing that people assume. For instance, they assume that the network is reliable. It is always there, it is always online, and it's, it's great. And of course, the latency of the network is zero, which doesn't really happen. So you have to account for that. You have to account for the network not being reliable, you have to account for the network sometimes timing out, stuff like that. You uh, assume that bandwidth is infinite, which is not either. You assume the network is secure, which is not. That the topology of the network doesn't change. That no, we, we, this service will always be here, will always be called the same, will always have the same address. Oh shit, it doesn't, crap. There is one single administrator that governs everything, every single part of the network. No, it doesn't, because it's that guy that runs the network, and Bob over there controls the firewall. And Bob's on vacation. Crap. Transport cost is zero, which means that it's the cost of putting this around and making sure that this one gets deployed here and this one gets deployed here. We ignore that when we decide to go to microservices. We have to create individual deploy scripts, maintain them, deploy them. And we also assume the network is homogenous, that everything looks the same, everything can be treated the same, which is often not the reality as well. So there are stuff in a distributed system that has to be handled that you don't have in a system that is gathered in one block. And these fallacies were created in the 90s, like the previous millennia century. So you have to handle and have a, a bearing on these things going down the microservice path. Now the other side doesn't seem as attractive either. We have this big ball of mud that everybody keeps warning. That's a technical term, by the way, big ball of mud. Every monolith will invariably dissolve into a big ball of mud, or spaghetti code, uh, stuff like that. The massive code files, everything disorganized, and so on. And what we like to refer as to the Norwegian arm. Has anyone had dinner with Norwegians where they just, oh, I want that thing. Instead of asking for it, they just stretch over the table and grab it. It's a thing that Norwegians do, unfortunately. And so we have the Norwegian arm in our code where this part of the code goes, oh, that thing. I'll just attach myself to that. And every change risks breaking a thousand things. So this is not the, a good place either. There are limitations in the size and the complexity in the monolith. They're too large to fully understand. You can't grasp, you can't keep the monolith in your head, necessarily. The size of it slows down the startup time. You have to play everything at once, which might or might not create problems. And very often, the impact of a change is poorly understood. And of course, ever since everything is in one application, you're limited in adopting new technology because you can't necessarily do that without changing everything. These are problems that people bump into. And of course, as something grows, complexity grows. We can't help that. That is a law of nature, even. Entropy and all of that. The problem with complexity is that as we introduce new bits to our application, we introduce new paths in our application, new couplings in our application. And this number doesn't increase linearly, it increases exponentially. Because each new thing has n the number of connections. And the next one has n plus one number of connections, and so on and so forth. So it, it increases very fast, suddenly. So it kind of hits a lot of people by surprise. It's like, oh, shit, things are actually bad, <laughs> suddenly bad. So what we need to do is introduce complexity dampening measures. We need to make sure that complexity is not allowed to grow uncontrollably. We have to keep it down a little bit. And the main reason for those problems in the monolith is that different parts are ill-organized. They are not clearly defined. And after a while, we get a pretty 
unmanageable amount of coupling ref the Norwegian arm stretching all over the place. What we need to do is box it. We need to make smaller and more contained boxes and limit their connections to other boxes. Now this helps with a lot of problems. A lot of the problems mentioned will start going away if you start doing this properly. Provided we're reasonably smart when creating these boxes, and here's the kicker, this actually takes some skill. But we should be able to build boxes that are small enough to fully understand and be independent so that you can get by with understanding just that box to do some actual work. Small enough to not have a lot of complexity, small enough to understand the impact of a change. Because we make some rules and some good practices when we do this. There's two measurements in our code that we want to control. One is called coupling. How many hard couplings do you have in your application? That is a number you want to keep low, especially on the level of the boxes. Heard about the depend on abstractions, not concrete implementations rule? Same thing here. Like, Don't depend, have a hard dependency on a box. If you have to depend on a box, make it a loose dependency. And the other one is cohesion. That the cohesion is a measurement of that things that belong together should be together. So things that are about the same thing, they should be in the same box. We want to keep that number high. So let's zoom in on a box and see what it might look like. Your box should have a clear boundary. It should be clear on what it communicates with other boxes and what is internal stuff and not for you. And so we make two, and we make two layers in our boxes. We have uh, the inner domain layer, the core. And if anyone has done, anyone done domain-driven design, stuff like that? Yeah, a couple of you. So this is your core domain objects, entities, domain entities, your bounded context, this box. And the outer layer, we call that our application layer. The domain layer is 100% internal to our box. Nothing from the internal domain layer goes outside the box. That is where we can do whatever we want as long as we're in that box. We understand that domain. That is where all our business rules exist. This is where you put your entities, your aggregate roots, your value objects, your domain services, all of the stuff that manipulates things that are within this box. Change, any change here is for a business reason. The application layer decides how other boxes or other or UI or other adapters or ports or whatever can communicate with our domain. For this, we use application services and various data transfer objects, DTOs, specialized objects without behavior, just moving data back and forth. These are services and objects that other services or boxes can take dependencies on. So we have our thing. We have a thing in our domain. What it does is important. And in our application, we'll have a thing service. And the thing service will return a thing DTO, a data transfer object. If another box wants to get a thing, they can't do that, not directly. Or actually, they can't do it at all. Another box or something outside our box will never get a thing. It would only get a thing DTO. It can only access the thing service and ask a question, say, hey, I would, like, I would like a thing with this ID, and you'll get something that the other part, party can pretend is a thing, but is not really a thing. It's a representation of the thing, customized for the thing service in this case. So here we control the surface of our box. We control the part where the box, how it talks to other entities. This makes it a lot easier to manage the complexity of our application, because now we don't have people taking hard dependencies on our things. So now we want to change stuff here for business reasons. We can do that without fear. 
We can write tests for the things that are they're really easy to test because they don't have any dependencies, not an infrastructure, not anything. So the logic here becomes easy to test. And the thing service has the responsibility of probably getting some stuff from the database, hydrating some objects, selecting some of it based on whatever qu question it got, and then transforming that into a DTO and delivering it on. So we can create these boxes for using principles of domain-driven design as subdomains or bounded context or whatever you want to help keep things understandable. One such box should be self-contained, logic and data. You can reason about the domain in the box in, such, in isolation. And you don't have to understand the other parts necessarily to understand what's, what's going on here. Now, boxes is a really poor name for it. In our application, we call these things features. It's an arbitrary name. You can pick whatever you want, whether that makes sense to you and your team. Context, domains, whatever, it's not really that important what you call it, but make a name and make it part of your ubiquitous language so the old team knows when you're talking, we're talking about a feature, everyone on my team understands what we're talking about. So I'll be calling it features. Now the communication boundary of a feature should be treated like a public API. You should be wary of changing it because this if you change that, you also have to change whoever is depending on your, your little thing. Now, changes are pretty easy, though, in a monolith. That's one of the advantages of a monolith. So if I want to change the public API, I can probably just use my refactoring tools in my editor and change whatever is consuming it. That is one of the advantages of starting out with a monolith when everything is in flux and you really don't know how things are going to be. Changes are easy. You should be conscious of a change. You should be conscious of what the change might affect. But again, in a monolith, you can get a very clear picture of what parts have a dependency on this thing. You can use tools in your IDE to say, hey, who's, that? who's referencing this part? Who's calling this DTO? Oh, I, OK, this one and this one, oh, only these two. And you can know that with a certainty. Unlike if you start making lots of microservices, it becomes very unclear suddenly what is, who's actually consuming what. External dependencies should also be handled in your application layer, insulated from your domain code. Makes your domain code easier to test again. So if your feature needs some stuff from another feature, it's the application service's responsibility to get that. And it uses the other features, one of their application services, to get that data. Now, we're starting out with this. It's tempting to have the, we have the thing, and we have a thing service, and say, oh, OK, everyone wants one of those. You get a thing DTO. Great. This might be fine when things are small, but it's Having a single thing service is probably not a good idea as you're growing because they get really large and long and you have a bunch of concerns coming in. And then when you have just a single thing DTO, you're like, okay, maybe that's everything cannot be represented with a thing DTO because then you have a thing list DTO and you have a thing select DTO and you have a thing this, thing that DTO. And maybe, maybe not, that's a good idea. So what we do is that we use use case handlers instead. It looks something like this. I'll zoom in on the code. Don't bother reading it yet. But that is the entire handler. It has, uh, on the top, it has a query object, which is a query object sent into my, my handler. And we're using Mediator for this, open source library by Jimmy Bogart, who's also here in the conference. Uh, it's a model that suits us very well. It makes it easy to create small handlers with associated requests and sometimes associated response objects. Our uh, request and response objects act as DTO classes, and sometimes we have DTO classes acting as a response object, depending on the, the feature. But each handler can also have their, their own response class, making that thing, again, that thing about sticking together, things that belong together should be together. Mediator pipelines also allow us to attach pre and post behavior for handlers, 
putting cross-cutting concerns like logging, authentication, and stuff like that outside the handler. This one has uh, the query here has the interface, I require registered vault user. It's a macro interface that says any request with that interface should also run this behavior. And this behavior, the implementation isn't interesting, but it will go in and it will make sure that there is, for the current logged on user, there will be a vault user and it will be of the registered kind and it will create that in the future if it needs to and back and forth. So when it comes to the handler here, which is this piece of code, the query already has a pre-populated existing vault user ID and we can guarantee that. So this is the actual handler. This stuff is easy to reason about. You can go in and see, oh, this, this thing does that. Of course, we're using a bunch of things here that there's domain specific things here. So if you're just reading, it's like, oh, okay, what's that thing? But for us who knows the domain, it's super easy to work with. And this is a whole thing. This is what we call a use case handler. This takes one piece, one use case. In this case is get box, uh, get my vault. So we have a thing in our application called a vault. And sometimes the user wants to get their vault. So we call this feature. Get a vault ID, here's the handler, that's it. And we have multiple of these. We have a whole bunch of these things. Depending, and each one has a use case, each one has a request object, each one has some kind of form of response, either in a DTO or in a, in a spe specialized request object. When a feature needs some information from another feature, we still like to use a service over a mediator handler. We use these handler mostly when external features or external services want us, like the web API, the endpoints want to call uh, into, the, uh, into the box, into the feature. Because calling mediator pipelines from mediator pipelines is, um, especially if you have behaviors, leads to weird results. They'll sometimes run twice and stuff like that. So calling another handler from another handler is not really recommended. But still, most of the calls to a feature will be from our endpoints. It makes the task service really small. And we can also have specialized task services for different use cases in addition. If not, it can always be, be split up. And also talking about endpoints. So if we have a feature, it will have a bunch of endpoints on the web. In this case, of, for instance, with an API, we have mostly an API server. And we can pull the definition of those endpoints also into our feature. So in this case, we're making a static extension class to the web application object in ASP.NET. And we add the endpoints. And then in our front end file, in our configuration file, startup file, we just add those for that feature. And we can do that with a lot of things. So all the stuff that is relevant for the feature, service registrations, mapping registrations, endpoint mapping, all kinds of configuration that this feature needs, we can put that into the feature, into the folder of the feature, and keep those things together. And we can just add it from our program startup to configure it, saying, hey, here's this thing, here's this feature. Call this line to configure it. And then by doing this, we create modules within our monolith. So we get a modular monolith where this feature is as self-contained as possible. So you can go into the feature. We use conventions. We have folder conventions. You do whatever you want. But we're using folder, folder conventions to say, OK, so when we go into a feature, I know what to expect to find there. I know there will be a file for configuration. I know there will be a file for service registration. I know there will be a file for endpoints. I know there will be a folder for features. I know there will be a folder for my domain. I know that's where I'll find my entities. So going into any feature becomes a much easier task than if we just had everything in one massive big ball of mud. So that's the point of this. The, 
the monolith doesn't have to devolve into a ball of mud. It can be, and doesn't have to devolve into spaghetti code. It can be those little ravioli, is that what they're called? Little thing where you have a little piece of dough and you have the meat and everything inside and you wrap it up and you stamp it together, like small self-contained little piece. So you have a bunch of those instead of spaghetti. Where each one is, has its own public surface, you know what you're getting, you really even don't know what's inside until you actually bite into it. <laughs> that can be funny. But small tangent, I have a, a friend in the US and they do Monday night footballs and they play chicken roulette where they have fried chickens, or like chicken legs, and one of them is injected with like dulce pepper, pepper sauce, <laughs> the strongest sauce they can find whatever, in whatever shop they go to. And so the clue is, who gets it during the night and takes a bite of it? And the trick is not to show it. Of course, they could fail miserably on that. So, <laughs> so by now, you might be thinking that, hey, we're, we're treating our features almost like a microservice, and that is absolutely right. We're taking some of the advantages of a microservice and implementing those in our modules. Remember the things we said at the beginning, microservice, highly maintainable, yeah. If you do it this way, each feature is highly maintainable. Testable, yeah. Do it this way, you, the domain will be highly testable. We're taking, we're enforcing some constraints to parts of a monolith in the same way that we would have done in a microservice. Another characteristic of microservices is that they are completely autonomous even with their data. So how do we do this with our features? Like one database per feature seems excessive. Well, should every feature have its own database? I, I don't think so. Maybe it should, but it doesn't need to. The important part is that our feature owns and controls their own data. So we need some way of doing that. And most relational databases today, which is what most people use, you can use what's called a schema, which is a namespacing feature in a database. Now most people, when they go to a database, they just start creating tables. And all the tables you create, they're part of a schema called DBO, database owner. But you can make your own schema. So for our Vault feature, we have a database schema called Vault. So we can have a table of Vault.User in the database. So we don't se go select star from user, we go select star from Vault.User. And then we have a chat feature. And then we go select star from chat.user. And so we get a namespacing in our database where we can have tables with the same names, but in different schemas. And they are not the same. They are, can be completely different. Now, in our DB context, we use entity framework. But you can, whatever you do, you can specify in schema in, in whichever way you want. But in our DB context, we can specify the default schema for all the tables for that context. And we have a separate DB context for each feature for Entity Framework. So Entity Framework has a DB context which controls access to the database, all the access goes through that. Every feature gets its own, which prevents us from overreaching, prevents us from having one feature reach in with its Norwegian arm into the database tables of another feature. We can do this by having, like, having, for instance, a base DB context. In this case, we have a base DB context with a protected abstract string called schema. And then we override the model on model creating where we can set the default schema on this context, on this model. And then on our vault context, we just set the schema to return vault. And we also get an error for this if we don't override it because it's abstract, so it needs to be overridden. That's part of falling into the pit of success and guiding our, our program developers into that path. Where, hey, if you're making a DB context, inherit from base DB context, oh, and you need to set the schema, oh, great, I'll set the schema. Okay, done. 
And now your context gets its own. Yes? No. Uh, each feature, so we have cases where um, similar domain objects, so the question was, do we have cases where domain objects appear in uh, several features, for instance, user? Yes and no. We have user in different features, but they're not the same. So Vault has its representation of a user, and Chat has its representation of a user, and they are different. They have different concerns, and they are involved, involved independently. Is it the same table? No, it's not. So we have chat.user, and we have vault.user tables. Again, they are different. They have different things. Um, vault has a thing where we create users that are sometimes registered with us, sometimes not. Sometimes they're relations of our, use, our customers, while chat has have uses that are always our customers, so they, have, they are different things. Um, why do we do that? And that is not a pain to maintain. Sure, and no. <laughs> um, because they only have a small slice of what they have. The thing that is usually common is the user ID, and sometimes the name. We keep the, sometimes the name in the uh, in the different tables, and those can be updated. When we update the name of a user, we use events. I'll get to that in a minute, to make sure that different features update their local representation of a thing. And also, some, uh, if it doesn't exist, the feature can often get the information it needs from the logon information. So user, log, user is logged on, and they present a bunch of claims. And in that user principle we get is the user ID and is the username. So we get that from there. But that's a, uh, another interesting point. How do we integrate between features? So I said that we have services that talk to, that we can uh, extract information from using our other features. The other way we integrate is using events. So we use in-process events in uh, the monolith. We use a feature where we have our we have our uh, domain objects can create an event saying, hey, my the username changed. For instance, in our identity feature, we, can have, we have the user, which is the canonical representation of a user, is the master data of user. It, has, it, has all, it is always right with regards to a user. So if someone goes in and changes their name, which happens, we get updates from the folk register and stuff like that. An event is created inside the domain object. We put that in the collection, it's the domain object. And then when you save stuff to the database, we go through event, domain events on the object, and then we emit those through, we use Mediator, and we emit those as notification. If you look up Clean Architecture by uh, Steve Ardalis online, you'll see a nice implementation of, implementation of that. And then we have in the different features that are interested in these things, we have notification handlers. So in our vault and in our chat feature, we would have a notification handler that would handle username changed event. So the identity feature changed the username. The user domain object has the knowledge that, that when I change, when the name changes, I will emit an event and when we store things in the database, the event is published. And then we have handlers in different features that pick up that event. Yes? No. Um, because we don't do cross transactions across DB contexts. So we use other mechanisms for transactions. Trans I'll get to that transactions in a while when we, we look, go out. Yes? Do you copy the event and uh, update it back? Uh, in theory, in practice, yes. Because when we hook up Mediator, uh, when we start Mediator in the application start, it will go through our code. So the question was, do we subscribe to events at application start? All of this is in process. So Mediator will go through my application to the, through the assembly and find 
all the notification handlers and whatever event they handle, and it will make a map of that. Yes? Yeah, so if I want to, can I easily extract what will be called by the emitted event? Since it's a monolith, I can right-click my event and say, find references. And I will get up all the places where that event type is, is uh, referenced, and I can see all the notification handlers that reference this event. So again, one of the advantages of a monolith is that my ID, IDE, my editor, Visual Studio, whatever you're using, can work with me. So it can easily show me where is this event being used. Oh, here, here, and here. Great. If I want to change the event, if I want to edit something, I can do that, and I can change the handlers. I can run my tests, and I can commit everything, and everything works right away. As for database transactions, we don't do cross-feature transactions because they're different DB contexts, and every DB is a unit that works, so it wouldn't really work. But doing database transactions across features is a bad idea anyway because it will bite you in the butt. <laughs> it is better to lift that one step up and do the transaction handling in your business logic. And in some cases, these events are not important. If they're lost in between, it's like, okay, someone has a... a Someone will complain that, hey, my, in the, my name in the chat isn't the same as my name. Oh, OK, we'll fix that. Don't worry about it. For important events, we, we can use different ways of transmitting it, like the in, outbox inbox pattern, which will work with transaction, and we, get, we can get at least one's guarantees. So check out the... Uh, Ian Cooper had a talk about that yesterday. Uh, I think it was called... I have the notes here somewhere. It was called at least once. It was on yesterday, but you should be able to find it on YouTube. Find, look at yesterday's live stream. It should be available in the Slack channel for room two. No, room f I can't remember which room it was. Find it on the, on this, on the uh, scheduler. But Ian Cooper's talk is, talks about exactly that, how to do uh, guaranteed delivery of events at least once. Um, yeah. So what's now we have our clearly defined uh, features. We have their domain objects, their application level handlers, services, notification handlers, all that stuff. The external communication is limited to pinpoint communication for that particular service or via an event. So. What's stopping our developers from just using their new genome? Because everything is in one application. Every class is only one using statement away, right? So there's, there's three ways you can do this. And you can trust your developers. And everybody's laughing, like, <laughs> what an idiot, trusting his developers. <laughs> I see you're a trusting bunch. <laughs> trust but verify. Well, you, we can, in, in to some degree, assume that we are all responsible adults. And we have routines in place for not people not doing cowboy coding, uh, either pair programming, which is, or code reviews and stuff like that. And we can have part of the definition of done, that when people go through a code review, like, OK, let's just check that we don't refer to namespaces that shouldn't be referred to. We don't do cross-feature communication, stuff like that. But you know, okay, trust but verify. Like, yes, we trust people, but people make mistakes. The other way is uh, making different projects and limiting communication between projects. But that becomes a lot of projects. So if you want to limit who can talk to the domain project, then you have to make that all those classes internal. You put that in a project for that particular feature. So any those classes can only access within those within that space. That works, but you get a lot of projects. There's a bunch of overhead with navigating. There's a bunch of overhead with building because the more projects you have, the longer time you build takes. 
The third option is using enforceable rules in your code. There's tools like NSDEPCON, I think it is, the DEPCOP, where you can set rules saying that these namespaces are allowed to talk to these namespaces and everything else is not allowed, or the other way around. So you can set rules which namespaces are allowed to communicate with which namespace. And if you're trying to communicate outside the scope of those rules, you'll get a build error. Your project won't compi compile, it will fail. And this runs as a ROSL analyzer. Uh, so it works whatever you, if you build on CI, if you build on computer, if you build on the command line, it will work either way. So that's, and they also have a, <laughs> they have a nice feature where you can, because um, when you do this, you get a lot of errors. But you can say, if you introduce this in existing projects, like, oh, she. <laughs> but you can tell it to stop at a certain point, like, OK, report. We have 100 errors. Don't, don't report anymore. And then just when the number goes down, OK, don't report more than 90. <laughs> and you can keep going down so you can start strangling your little thing little by little. So they have, they have, they've thought about that, that when you introduce this, you're, nothing will build. So you can you can limit you can say okay I don't want no I want no errors and we'll keep fixing it after a while yes. So there are parts of my domain or my my feature that are will be accessible to other features. My DTO objects, my events, my services or their interfaces if I'm if I'm using interfaces. So we'll have some stuff that will be available for others to access. That is my public API surface. Those are my services, those are my endpoints, those are my objects that will cross my boundary. So the point here is not to let anything in, but the point is to be explicit about what is allowed and what is not allowed. So you can see, you can see and use these things, but not these things. These things are secret, oh, we keep them safe, keep them secret. And these things, yeah, you can play with those and I control that surface independently from the internals in here. So why, well, it's always weird when the technician comes like, oh, okay, well, this thing's blown up, it looks fine. Uh, so why do we do this? And I said, well, bu uh, building a glorious monolith and carving it into microservices. We don't do this because we want microservices in the end. We do this because this is creating good software. This is how you get maintainable software that is easy to build, easy to work with, easy to test. It's just good practice to do it this way. There are various ways of, uh, or have names to do sort of the same thing. Vertical slice architecture, hexagonal architecture, Onion architecture, clean architecture, they're all basically saying the same thing, that, okay, make small defined features, make sure you have a core domain, you have application services wrapping this, talking inwards, and nothing talks outwards. But there are good reasons to go to microservices. It's not a stupid concept. It's not wrong, it's just usually wrong for you. <laughs> and we have this thing in our business because, oh, Netflix does this thing, so I need to do it. Newsflash, you're not Netflix. <laughs> not in the first five to 10 years, at least. But there are valid reasons to use microservices. One of them is, or distributed application, which is a more a broader term. Microservices is a very specific thing. And, and people get microservices wrong as well. They build nano services instead of microservices, but that's a different matter. But team topology is one. Microservices, as an organization scales, monoliths don't really scale well with an organization. Because what when an organization scales, you start splitting up in different teams. And if you have a monolith, then you create dependent, hard dependencies between your teams. Because now this team is dependent on that team for doing this thing and this thing, and we want to deploy this thing, and we can't do that because these things, people have something they want to get in before we do this deploying and so on and so forth. 
and that's annoying. That creates friction in our day-to-day -day work. So splitting up parts of our, sim uh, of our system to be managed completely by autonomous teams over there, that could be a good way to scale. There's technical considerations. Parts of the application might, after a while, have different technical demands than other parts. We had one case where one part of application was dependent on locally installed fonts, because we were making PDFs. And it turns out that's hard to do in Azure web apps. <laughs> so we could carve off an application and say, okay, you can run over here. You can generate PDFs over here. You're not running an Azure web app. You're doing something else. We've had maybe a different language is better for a particular purpose. Maybe one part of the application is doing some machine learning. Maybe that should be in Python instead of C Sharp. Maybe you want to create a rules engine and, hey, I, I want to create this thing with F Sharp, which sure, it can be in the same thing, but maybe it should be a different thing and, and separate on, on its own. So there can be technical considerations for taking this part and saying, okay, that's a, that's a separate thing. And you can also want to scale different parts individually. One moment. It can be cheaper to take one part and scale that instead of scaling the whole thing. Yes, you had a question. How do you divide your code base right now, we've uh, usually about five. So we're a small, we're a small team. Uh, we usually work in pairs, but we're very well, uh, we communicate a lot. So for us, it makes perfect sense to have a monolith. As we're growing, and we start getting more teams, then monolith might not make as much sense. Then we'll say, okay, this thing goes off here. This thing might go off here. And we do that by doing this work we've done, we've prepared for that. So the work of splitting off, of carving off a thing now, is that if you're not careful when you're making a distributed application, you're making a distributed monolith where you have all the same problems that a ball, ball of mud have, except you have a network in between as well. So that's kind of, <laughs> kind of sucky. So then you get the disadvantage of both sides and none of the advantages. Luckily for you, you've been paying attention. <laughs> so your application is ready for this. So this thing service we've been using from all the other services, we can change the implementation of that in our monolith. And we have our feature. It is pretty self-contained. All the configuration is in the feature. We can take most of that code, copy it somewhere else into a new application, plug it into the startup for the configuration, boot it up. We have endpoints going and everything. So now everything there is in this one application. It has its own database. Not technically. They can still use the same actual database server, but it has a separate schema. So it doesn't, they don't interfere with each other. We don't integrate on the database level. But if you want to, we could take those tables and move to a different database as well, if we wanted to. It wouldn't matter, because nobody else should be using those. So that's mostly a copy-paste job or a, a, a move thing. So the thing service back in our monolith now becomes an interface or a service that I can override the methods on and say, hey, when you're calling this method, I'm not calling my domain feature. I'm doing a network call to the other service instead. And then the rest of my application can continue to work. Maybe I want to use events instead. I oh, want to use the inbox outbox pattern, using events, messaging, reply channels, and stuff like that. I can still do that in my thing service. I might want to rewrite some of the, application, the code that is using these things. But it will be a small surgical change. I need to fix the events. So whatever events are happening that my application is interested in, my feature is interested in, or whatever app events my feature puts out, I need to put those on an event somewhere else. I can use the inbox outbox pattern. I can use a message queue. I can use event grid. I can use whatever I want. Just pick one. But you need to make events network capable. So that's a job you have to do when you carve out your first microservice. But it's a very defined technical job. And once you've done it once, you've done it for the rest. So the it adds a bit of complexity, but the complexity is fixed. It's a one-time thing. The biggest challenge is transactional consistency. 
So in your monolith, you might have depended on transactions in one way. You should not do that. If you do it, you're cheating because it shouldn't really be done across DB contexts. So transactions should be moved up as a business concern. Is our transactions important for this? I'm doing these two things. If I, this one goes well and this one fails, what happens? So you should take that into account when you're building a monolith. So again, look at Ian Cooper's talk at least once for how to do messaging between different parts of your application. It works the same whether you're in a monolith or whether you have a distributed system. It doesn't really matter. So in summary, starting a new application with distributed microservices, that's playing this game on hard mode. Lots of work, very little return, at least at the beginning. Building a modular monolith will give you many of the advantages of microservices, the good parts, very few of the disadvantages, all the fallacies that you need to think about. It requires some thinking, it requires some discipline, a little bit of extra complexity in the beginning, but that complexity is more or less fixed. It doesn't increase much more, as much over time as a little bit of infrastructure that just sits there. Enforce clear feature boundaries. Be very explicit about what you give out. And use services for cross-feature communication or events or messaging. Lift your transactions up. And the point is not to build something ready to be carved into a bunch of microservices. The point is to make a maintainable, glorious monolith. And it's perfectly OK for have multiple teams working on the same monolith. It takes a little bit of more discipline. But if you're thinking, hey, this is actually not as fun, start carving. Bring out that carving knife and slice along. You have already created the seams to cut along by using your services, using your public API. So that's it. If you have any questions, any more questions over there, perhaps? Nope. Oh, there's one. Uh, technically, you can. No, you should not. Because then you're, yeah, then you're integrating on the database level, and you really shouldn't do that. Because then it makes it hard to say, I want to move my, this piece of data to a different database, and then your life sucks. You could. You have to make it manually, because uh, the DB context doesn't know about those things. So if you really wanted to, you could. But it would be better to not do it and rely on integration with events instead because that would be a more maintainable solution. Yes? Yes, we have, do we have separate migrations? Yes. So each DB context has their own migration, which works out nice, because they, they can perfectly coexist in the same database. Yeah, the migration table is common to all the, uh, the entry framework has one common uh, migration table, but all the migrations go in there, uh, fit neatly. If you want, you can use uh, um, a convention for your naming so you can see which migration is what, but it's not really a problem. Oh, back in the, oh, can't see it because of the lights, sorry. Pretty much do it, so. Uh, Yeah, so I'm, cr I'm building my monolith as a bunch of services in a service-oriented architecture just wrapped in a monolith. Pretty much, yeah. So it's Problems with monoliths are the scaling beyond a single machine and dependencies on operating system and libraries. Uh, yeah, if those things become a problem for parts of your application, that's when you carve things out in a microservice. Uh, scaling a monolith across machines is not really a problem. Uh, you just have to make sure that, th and that would be the same as scaling a microservice across machines for the things that you need. You'd have a uh, Distributed cache, if you have that, if you have a distributed in-memory database behind, stuff like that, that would be the exact same thing. There's no problem scaling a monolith horizontally uh, because we don't depend on internal state, in-memory in state. Um, 
As long as you don't do that, it's not really an issue. Okay, I'm running out of time, I think. Oh, question over there, I got four minutes left. Yeah. So organizing folders versus organizing projects and advantages, disadvantages with deployment. So with a monolith, it's deployed in one go. Whether I have multiple projects or I have everything in one project, it's still deployed in one go. We have some projects, so we have some, uh, we split out a, a, thing, a, co a couple of things in projects, so we have infrastructures, separate projects, stuff like that. We have a common project with some shared kernels, that is, we have some separate services, so we have a common uh, library that is, uh, is among those things. So any code that should be shared among applications, they should definitely be in their own project. But apart from that, I like keeping things in folders instead of projects. It's easier to reason about, the build time is slightly shorter, and I find it easier to navigate. But it's, uh, it's a preference thing. Um, you wouldn't deploy features independently uh, unless you're actually doing microservices, and that, then you make a whole different project, different solution, different thing. So you wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to make assemblies for deployment. Uh, you might want to have assemblies to enforce rules that this, these things are eternal to that project, these things are eternal to this project, but... Uh, we're using not feature flagging at the moment, uh, but it would be perfectly fine to use feature flagging in in uh, those things, we uh, try to build small things and deploy as often as possible to production. So we deploy a monolith multiple times a day, and that works fine. We uh, we deploy to Azure Web Apps, we deploy to a staging slot, and then it deploys there and boots up, and then we swap the slot. So it's a zero downtime deployment. So whether it take, if it takes two minutes or 30 seconds to deploy the monolith, we don't care, it doesn't matter for us. Yep. Any other questions? Do you mind if I take a picture of you a lot? <laughs> there was actually a lot of people here. That's kind of cool. And over there, I should be Edgar. I have a panorama thing going. <laughs> so uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be here wrapping down my stuff. I'll be available for a little bit. And also, if I have one recommendation, there's a uh, if not the next session, but the session afterwards, there's a session on mental strength and, and victory instinct. I really want to go see that because that is, uh, I think that's going to be a special thing. So I'd, I'd suggest that one. <laughs> Thank you.